Hi, I'm Dr. Val Russo. Welcome to the first part of this trigonometry tutorial. Many people are scared when they hear the word trigonometry, but the truth is that there is nothing to fear about it. Trigonometry is a very simple and natural concept, as we shall see. It is also very useful in many situations. For instance, in order to make the animations in this video, I had to use trigonometry. I will explain how, but for now, let us start by giving some reminder about right triangles. Trigonometry comes naturally when considering right triangles, but we will see that it can be used for any triangle. I probably won't teach you much by saying that a right triangle has one right angle, or a 90 degree angle. The longest side of a right triangle is called the hypotenuse. Now let us call alpha one of the two remaining angles, for example, the one on the left. In the following, this will be our angle of interest. This angle is formed by the hypotenuse and by the other side that is adjacent to it. That's why we call it the adjacent side. The remaining side is opposite to the angle, and you won't be surprised to know that we call it the opposite side. Note that these definitions of adjacent and opposite sides are relative to the chosen angle of interest. Should we have chosen the other angle at the top right, the adjacent side would be the vertical side, while the opposite side would be the horizontal side. So, keep in mind that these definitions are relative. Now, something that you probably already know about is the Pythagorean theorem. I won't derive it in this tutorial, I simply state it as we will need it. This theorem is the famous a squared plus b squared equals c squared. With our present definitions, it is stated as hypotenuse squared equals adjacent squared plus opposite squared. To understand where the idea of trigonometry comes from, it is useful to consider the concept of similar triangles. Let us take a particular right triangle with our angle alpha whose value is unknown. But we know the length of each side. We can easily count the squares and see that the adjacent side measures 8 squares while the opposite side measures 6 squares. For the hypotenuse, I'll let you apply the Pythagorean theorem and you should find that it measures exactly 10 squares. Similar triangles are triangles that are obtained from one another by multiplying or dividing all sides' lengths by the same number. For example, the green triangle is obtained from the blue one by dividing all lengths by 2, while the red triangle is obtained from the blue one by multiplying all lengths by 2. As a result, the green triangle has an adjacent side that measures 4 squares, an opposite side that measures 3 squares, and a hypotenuse that measures 5 squares. You can check that these measurements agree with the Pythagorean theorem. Likewise, the red triangle has an adjacent side of 16 squares, an opposite side of 12 squares, and a hypotenuse of 20 squares. Once again, I'll let you check that this is in agreement with the Pythagorean theorem. Now, you can see something very particular about similar triangles. Although they have different sizes, they have the same angles. We can clearly see it in the case of the angle alpha, for which the corresponding vertices of the three triangles are perfectly superposed. Another particular thing is that the ratios between any two sides' lengths are the same for all similar triangles. Let us check this explicitly. For the green triangle, the ratio between opposite and hypotenuse is 3 over 5. For the blue triangle, this ratio is 6 over 10, which simplifies to 
3 over 5, while for the red triangle this ratio is 12 over 20, which again simplifies to 3 over 5. So this ratio is the same for the three triangles. In a similar way, we can easily check that the ratio between adjacent and hypotenuse simplifies to 4 over 5 for the three triangles. And it also works for the ratio between opposite and adjacent, which we find that it simplifies to 3 over 4. So, let us keep in mind that if we don't change the angle alpha, the ratios between adjacent side, opposite side, and hypotenuse don't change either, and vice versa. If we don't change the ratios, then the angle alpha doesn't change. Let us go back to our initial triangle with an adjacent side of 8 squares, an opposite side of 6 squares, and a hypotenuse of 10 squares. This gives us the three following ratios. Let us now change the length of the opposite side to 9 squares and keep the adjacent side as it is. The hypotenuse must change accordingly. I let you calculate what the hypotenuse length is now and you should find these new values for the ratios. So they changed, but look, the angle alpha also changed. Let us go back one more time to our initial triangle with these ratios. If instead of changing the length of the opposite side, we change the adjacent side, all the ratios change again, and so does the angle alpha. From this analysis, we can conclude that the ratios depend on the angle alpha. If we don't change the angle, the ratios don't change either. But if we change the angle, all the three ratios change. Thus, each ratio is a function of the angle. We can write that opposite over hypotenuse is some function, let us call it f, of the angle alpha. Adjacent over hypotenuse is a different ratio, so it is another function, g, of the angle alpha. Same story for opposite over adjacent, which is another function h of the angle alpha. Now we are ready to define the trigonometric functions. The point is that the functions f, g and h are so important and used so much that people decided to give them special names. As a result, we define the sign of the angle alpha as the ratio opposite over hypotenuse. The cosine of alpha is defined as the ratio adjacent over hypotenuse and the tangent of alpha is defined as the ratio opposite over adjacent. You can easily remember these definitions by memorizing the word SOCATOA sine opposite hypotenuse, cosine adjacent hypotenuse, tangent opposite adjacent. Now the question is, what can we do with these trigonometric functions? Before answering, we have to analyze these functions, which we will do in part 2.